You're tuned in to RX Radio. Movement prescribed. Brought to you by Prescript.com. A personalized approach to keeping you healthy and making your best even better. Your hosts, Dr. Jordan Shallow and Dr. Jordan Ginta. What's up, guys? Welcome back to RX Radio. Uh, today we have a really cool episode for you. I got to sit down with John North. If you guys know anything about weightlifting or if you know anything about the history of weightlifting in America, you've heard the name John North before. Uh, this guy's an icon. He's definitely one of the most entertaining people that has ever touched a barbell. And he's got a really great life story. So I was really excited that I got to sit down with him and kind of talk about just his journey through weightlifting, through life, uh, we touched on a lot of different topics here. Uh, so this is a really cool podcast. The one unfortunate thing is that we did have a little bit of technical difficulty recording this. So the sound quality is not the best, but thank you to Kyle, uh, Kyle Lundy, um, for making it listenable. There are, it's not perfect, but um, I just hope that uh, the quality doesn't take away from John's story because he has a lot of great insight um, and it really gives you a good look into who he is and and where he's been. Um, So don't let the audio quality take away from that. Um, Before we get into it, just make sure that you guys are keeping an eye on Prescript. We have some cool stuff coming out very soon, the next couple of weeks. Um, So make sure you keep your eyes on that. But let's get into this thing. Here we go. Hey, Jordan, thanks for having me on the show, man. I'm pumped to be here. I'm pumped to have you, man. Yeah, I really am, man. And real quick, big congrats on the Arnold for you, man. You kicked butt. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. I really appreciate that. It was cool to see you uh, compete. Uh, you did great. And then we uh, we got a great session in at the uh, the Rogue Training Center afterwards. And you, you hit big numbers there, too, the very next day. <laughs> I know. I lifted better with you the next day than I did on the platform. <laughs> uh, oh. Uh, training, local meets, national meets, three different sports. Yeah, absolutely. Sports. I always, I always say that. Um, gosh, man, I just, I'm drinking a, uh, what is this? Rockstar. Rockstar. Blue, blue Raz. <laughs> so, nice. I'm feeling good. I'm really glad to be on your show, Jordan. Um, and uh, gosh, I mean, about me, it, it was kind of like the USAW. I just got uh, level one certified. Uh, a awesome. few months congratulations ago. Oh, hey thanks man yeah and when they're everyone's going around introducing themselves and uh, a lot of strength coaches there but everyone's <laughs> you know i'm a master's this phd this you know yeah. got my undergrad in this and you know just beautiful resumes explaining themselves so then it got to me and nobody nobody knew who i was there because i don't know it was just more of a kind of everyone there was kind of more strength coach um so I just say, hey, my name's John. I'm a, I'm a gym rat, and I love weightlifting. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> that was my introduction, and everybody was kind of taken back, and they're like, who's this loser? <laughs> what a, you're one pathetic loser. So, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> so that's pretty much me, man. I just I love weightlifting. I love the sport. Um, you know, I'm just uh, you know, I'm just uh. Just, just a man that loves to lift weights, you know, and yeah. uh, that, that's that's pretty much it, man. Man, I can I can sympathize with that. A man that loves to weight, lift to love, to loves lift to lift weights. weights. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm getting an echo still on my end. So oh, are you? Throw me out. Oh. It's okay though. It's it's recording just fine, I think. Oh. But um, that's incredible. When it comes to experience in weightlifting, though, you pretty much have a doctor, a PhD more education than anyone you've been around the block a couple times with that so. um can you take us back to the beginning and how it all started yeah i mean i'll i'll make it short um i don't want to bore any listeners out there so i'll just be real blunt. trust me you're not boring us <laughs> no, <I'll laughs> this just, is why we're here you know uh, strength it, for, i played junior college football um for for well pretty much four years <laughs> to get my associate's degree yeah not too book smart, if you will. Um, kind of a troubled kid growing up. Uh, 
throughout middle school and high school. So when I graduated high school, my mom did the best thing ever to me. She said, okay, but uh, son, you have two options, military or out of state junior college. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, nice. I like how I like the out of state was in there. Not, not in, you know, cause <laughs> you know, you always locally have your little community colleges. Right. Said, right. No, no, you are leaving. And uh, <laughs> it's time to go, John. Yes, yeah, spread your wings, son. Out of state junior college. <laughs> the was, I was really good at high school football. I was um, second team all league my senior year, and um, you know, I was I was really good running back in, in high school. Honestly, I probably could have been first team all league if I would have dedicated more time to football. I was kind of a troubled kid, so. I uh, should have, would have, could have, though. But uh, bad grades. So junior college it was. Went to college at the Siskiyous in Weed, California. Because actually in Oregon, um, there's no junior college football. Okay. In Oregon, there's no football in junior college. So the closest one is right over the border in Weed, California. Siskiyou County. Beautiful. And uh, you actually get in-state tuition because of the whole situation. Because uh, they want football players from Oregon to go to Weed. Um, so got there, basically long story short, uh, started for one year, got a little playing time, you know, um, still grades were horrible, barely getting by with the grades, um, had to take a ton of summer classes, even just to play the following year. I was that guy and all, I was always in the summer classes, you know, John, why are you in this painting class? Well, I gotta try to get a B to play next year. Like just constantly that guy, you know? And, uh, you know, probably not like at that time a D1 guy. And, you know, I kind of knew football was, was really not for me. You know, I don't think I was next level in football. And, uh, you know, the grades were, were basically too bad to, to go anywhere else, to be honest. So basically when I, when I graduated with my associate's degree, um, I did graduate from that school, which is great. And I did walk, by the way. Uh, my whole family was there, you know, the whole ceremony for your associates, which is pretty cool. Congratulations, man. Yeah, my mom's like, you're walking. You're walking. We're all going. It's a huge deal. (laughs) So basically what happened was it was summertime, and I was walking the streets of Weed, California on campus, just there. And my strength coach, Coach Tim Frisbee, pulls over, and he just goes. And I, I loved the weight room. I was always really, really, really good in the weight room. I was kind of the weight room guy. Yeah, you ever have one of those. <laughs> yeah, I think I've been hit at some point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> try to at least. You're just the guy that's like jacking everybody up and yelling. I was on Arnold and lifting. And I always had the highest numbers and the clean, and I was good at the snatch and all this kind of stuff. So I was like one of those guys that like I like the weight room more than I like going out to the football field. Yeah. So my strength coach pulls over, and he was off the uh, offensive line coach too, and he was kind of my mentor throughout the close to four years there. And he just goes, John, what the, are you still doing here? <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, kind of like, like your mom? mom? Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> like the next chapter of that. So, Time to leave. Yes. Yeah, like, what are you doing? And, and, I'm, and, I, and I remember looking at him, and he said it in such kind of like a mean way, but in like a caring way, like, go away. Spread your wings. It's, it's time to move on, you know? And um, I just looked at him, and I said, well, coach, I don't know where to go, you know? Yeah. I don't know what to do. Yeah, definitely. And I said it kind of in a sad way. Of, I was very lost. I was, this is, you know, you're in college. It's what you know for so long. It's, it's your home. It's your comfort. And I was just staying there even after I graduated. And uh, should I'd probably still be there if he didn't yell at me. So um, <laughs> he said, look, let's figure out what, we, what you're going to do in your life. I was like, all right. So he took me to his office. He said, hey, did you know that, snatch clean jerk that you love to do and that you're pretty good at is, a, is an Olympic sport. I said, I had no idea. I, had, I really had no idea. He goes, I know the strength coach or the head weightlifting coach at Sac State. He goes, get my car. I'm driving you down there. So he drove me to Sacramento State College. Wow. Literally introduced me to the weightlifting coach. And before I even could say goodbye, he was off. <laughs> he literally <laughs> dropped me <laughs> off and then just left. And <laughs> the dust hit my face. And uh, I was like, okay, I'm homeless. I'm here. I guess I'm a weightlifter. And nice. uh, 15 <laughs> years later, I'm talking to you, Jordan. 
So that's, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a very abrupt start into weightlifting. Yeah. I do this because I don't have a home otherwise. Yes, you just drop it. <laughs> uh, that's incredible. I think for the most part, the, the people that have seen you on the internet um, know you from the old, old strength. strength YouTube videos. Yeah. So how did you transition from Sac State into that atmosphere at Cal Strength with, um, I mean, back in the day with Donnie Shankel and Glenn Penley? Right. Yeah, I was, I was fortunate enough to meet Donnie at a local meet, and I was always a big fan of Donnie. And um, uh, I went from uh, Team Sac State, and then I eventually – over about a year and a half, went over to Team Hassle Free with, with Paul Doherty um, oh, and Coach nice. Jackie oh, Maul nice. and, and, and Kevin Doherty, who was based out of San Francisco. And I was on Team Hassle Free for, for a few years, and um, that was fantastic. Um, I um, ended up leaving that team over my own mistake um, of, <laughs> uh, well, to be honest with you, I punched a guy. And uh, I, got kicked, I got kicked off. Yeah, you can't just drop that and not yeah, tell the story. story. Uh, so the thing is, is that I didn't get kicked off the team for it because, even though, God, do I regret that? That's a tough one. Um, I do regret that because it's a, it's a sin, and uh, I wouldn't have done it again. Uh, okay. I was actually okay. defending my my girlfriend, which who is my wife now, uh, because somebody. Um, called it a B word right in front of her face. So I punched him. And now it, so the thing is that I didn't get kicked off the weightlifting team because everyone kind of like didn't like the guy. And what he did was way over the line. And a lot of people said I would have done the same thing. So it was that kind of situation. But the situation was is that, as if you know, hassle free, it's at the high school, yeah. Hassle, yeah. Out of Sacramento High. So because of that word got out, I got kicked off campus. So then I wasn't allowed to go back to the to the team. So, so gosh, now, now you're starting this all. So here I am, you know, my wife are lifting at like powerhouse gym in the back with a bunch of like strong man on like a bar that doesn't spin. And oh, brutal, gosh, at the brutal. time we're um, like homeless. We're living in a Dodge Neon. We were wow. in this like really wow. ghetto place in an apartment. We got kicked out because we couldn't pay rent and you know, we're doing anything we can to train. And I was a janitor at a nutrition, uh, nutri shop. It's a supplement store. Yeah. Um, some yeah. guy at the powerhouse, you know, um, saw that I was a good weightlifter and I was training for the American open. And he kind of like, uh, figured out my situation, how we were basically, you know, broken homeless. Um, cause we were at the time actually sleeping in my, my car. And, uh, He's like, hey, man, I'll just pay you under the table, and you could just, like, basically clean up the shop and vacuum and take the trash out, and I'll just, like, you know, give you some cash. I said, like, great. So I worked there for a few months training at the powerhouse gym. Um, and at that point, you know, my, my wife was getting a lot of heat from her family, and my family was kind of upset, like, you know, what's your guys' plan? What are you doing in life? You know, this bum that you're with, sweetie, is, you know, like, he needs – there needs to be some sort of direction. So it got to the point where I was about to join the police academy. I actually even registered for the, uh, the police academy. And then I was at a local meet competing and ran into Donnie. And um, Donnie, and long story short, he invited me out to California Strength to train. Um, and uh, I, I remember I walked up to him and, I, and uh, I said, Donnie, how do you get so strong? I'm a big fan of this. You know, how do you get so strong, Donnie? And he said, oh, God damn it, son, you just got to get strong. Uh, that, that's what he said to me. Is just, you got to get strong. So I said, okay, yes, sir. Uh, we kind of hit it off. He saw me lift. He approached me after the competition and said, meet me at Cal Strength Wednesday at like 2 o'clock. And uh, I just said, okay. Drove down there with my wife um, and, uh, gosh, pulled up in the, the old Dodge Neon and trained with Donnie, and, and the rest is history. So, I mean, I walked in that gym, and the entire gym was filled with cigarette smoke. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's just like Donnie Shankle, Dave Spitz, Max Ada, and about like 10 Bulgarians oh my like, God. just lifting with their shirts off, just getting after it. And I was like, what is this place? <laughs> this, is so cool. this is a lot different than the powerhouse. So yeah, that, 
that's pretty much how that happened. Wow. That's a really good story, and it gives a lot of insight that when you're coming from that scenario, that situation where you're literally living out of your car, it's training's easy after that, right? If life is hard, training is easy. That's incredible, though. So from that point, I've seen you lift a couple times. I saw you, the first time I saw it in person was actually Nationals last year in Memphis, and literally every single person in that room had their eyes on you. You just have this way about drawing attention in and you lift with such intensity. Where does that come from? What's going through your mind when you're lifting and when you're on the platform competing that, that brings that intensity? Right. So it's, uh, it's basically a character I created, um, a monster I created. And, you know, it's, it's really... It's it's kind of an odd thing because it's it's one hundred percent authentic. I a hundred percent believe that. Yeah, and, and anybody who's seen me live like you're saying would attest to that. It's it, there's nothing fake about it, but mm -hmm. it's still a creation. It's not really who I am, or maybe it's a limb of who I am, uh, a branch of who I am. Um, you know, because I'm really insecure, and the weights scare the hell out of me. Just they just scare the living daylight out of me. And walking on that stage is just always, always the scariest thing I do, even to this day. So long into it, so I felt like over time, like when I lift, I kind of turn into this character, this shankle yelling, bar slamming, chair throwing, like crazy man. Yeah, and uh, I've just I've used this this character that I didn't even really create that kind of just created itself to lift the weights for me and to uh, kind of block away the fear and the insecurity, so that when I walk on stage, it just takes over, and um, I uh, I just kind of go with it, um, and so that's pretty much what that is is. It's 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 not really me, but it, it, I guess it kind of is. There's something inside of me that comes out where I just I become I'm so scared of the weights that I have to create a mindset that pretty much turns me into almost a different person um, yeah. to block that to block that fear out and. Uh, I think because of that, um, you know, kind of the whole, Hulk, you know, Hulk thing happens, right? I just rip the shirt <laughs> off and I just kind of go crazy. And it's, you know, it's hurt me a lot in life, you know, because it's, I can, that can kind of happen off the platform too. Uh, so, you know, I always like to say that my weightlifting is, my life is kind of a double-edged sword, you know, it's helped me a lot in life, but hurt me a lot in life as well. Um, you're going to win a lot of meets and you're going to lift some big weight, but also, you know, you're, you're going to make a lot of bad decisions and, um, you know, make a lot of mistakes at the same time with that type of, when that character comes out. Um, so that, that would be kind of my answer to that. So, Yeah, I'd imagine that same personality trait is the same reason why you're crushing big lifts on the platform, but at the same time punching this guy in the face and getting kicked off the team at the same time. You know? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. No. I've. I've. Well, I'm no saint. You know, and I've. I've made a lot of bad decisions in my life, and that's one out of many, 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 many. Um, and um, you know, it's. Uh, yeah, I've learned a lot in the sport of weightlifting, and uh, and throughout life, that's that's for sure. Um, but uh, you know, I've tried to lift calm. You know, I've tried to like kind of tame that inner monster that comes out when I lift and uh, I just I like I bomb out at every meet and uh, I just I can I've even tried I've even I've even tried to tame that monster but I just gotta let it loose man like the minute I grab that bar in the warm-up room it's just don't even don't even talk to me because I'm I'm not John at that time yeah I think a lot of people have that to some degree I don't think as many people are effective at channeling it as you are, though. Got it. 
I think so too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I know guys that are like super focused, but they're not even like, they're not even there. Like, you know, for instance, like Travis Cooper, you know, Travis Cooper is a real focused, calm lifter. But like, if you look into his eyes when he's warming up and competing, he's not even there. You know what I mean? You're like, you're looking into his eyes. You're like, Hey, is that even Travis? <laughs> you know, and, and, and it's the same with you. You know, I remember we seeing you compete, like when you're sitting in that warm up room chair and you're doing your thing. It's like you're just such in a zone as us us lifters are such. We get such in a in a in a mental space, and everyone has their own mental space, and that's all that is. And um, yeah, yeah, that mental space is hard for lifters to find. It takes time to find out like who you are as a lifter, what gets you going. What do you got to tap into emotionally to get you to like walk out on that stage and lift that big weight? And that takes yeah, time and yeah. practice. It really does. Absolutely. I know you said it's kind of a combination of your fear and some other things. I think really what it is is where your fear meets your confidence and you're in this state where you know you can do it, but you, you don't want to fail and you put this expectation on yourself and it just makes it that much more scary right heck yeah absolutely yeah yeah um, um cool, cool. So, so to kind of, kind of play off that, that i i want to hear more about these bulgarians <laughs> so what so you you met donnie shankle and he told you you had to get strong mm -hmm. is that what kind of set off set you down this trajectory towards pursuing yeah. strength and greatness and weightlifting yeah yeah i mean i always knew that even from back in the college of the Siski days, the junior, I always loved weight lift, weight space lifting. I just didn't know weight lifting one word was an Olympic sport. So when I found out it was an Olympic sport, I was like, oh, this is something I'm actually good at in life. I want to do this. You know what I mean? Because I was a kid that grew up in the resource rooms in school, really troubled with um, kind of fitting in and really troubled, kind of troubled uh, as far as like book smarts and, uh, didn't really didn't know what I wanted to be in life at all. So like when I found something that I was passionate about and I was pretty okay at, I was like, oh man, how exciting is this? This is what I want to do. And so from basically college to well to now, we're still doing it. I just it's just it was just the passion of mine. So California strength was a way where I could train full time, become a pro weightlifter, and really chase my dreams. Um, but California strength was an interesting place because I have never seen weightlifting like that before. Um, the technique of the lifters was extremely, extremely different than I was, um, what I knew, uh, the mindset, the programming was off the wall bonkers. <laughs> um, just the, the lifestyle was so different at California strength. It was truly just a professional team of weightlifters, and that's what they did. There was no job. There was no outside anything. You lift all day. And when I say all day, I say, I mean all day. All the time. That's what you do. And um, so I dove in and realized that those lifters uh, like to smoke cigarettes. So I ended up smoking as well. And so... You know, we're we're probably putting down close to two packs a day, a pack wow. a day to a two packs a day. Yeah. Um, we'd smoke, we'd lift, we'd eat, we'd smoke, we nap. Took a lot of naps during the day. Um, you know, and uh, took a little nap, watched you know like a something on the TV. Went back out, trained, uh, hit a squat, have a smoke, max out in the snatch go to KFC, <laughs> clean jerk, have a smoke, front squat, go to In-N-Out Burger, come back, front squat, have a smoke, snatch, have a smoke, clean jerk. And this oh went on goodness. six week every day. Wow. So there, there was no sessions. Okay. Right? It this it's just was, training days, just literally all day of just training. Now, when Coach Penlay got there, it changed, and um, 
you know, there was a little more set schedule. But yeah, man, it was definitely, um, and, you know, Spitz brought in uncle, you know, Ivan Avajayev, the greatest weightlifting coach ever, the head Bulgarian coach um, for decades. And so it was Ivan Avajayev who just uh, went to open the Aliko Center down the street. He kind of just moved on and um, there's still a lot of lifters there. So there was just a lot going on in that whole San Ramon area with Spitz and Cal Strength and Ivan Avajayev. And uh, gosh, Ivan Avajayev was lived at Dave's house for, uh, for I think over a year uh, and had all the lifters, you know, live with Dave and Max and Donnie. And that's why these guys are so knowledgeable. And um, I kind of missed that first series of California strength. I kind of got in there at like the end of that first chapter, um, but I got to experience so much kind of toward the tail end there um, before California strength kind of, you know, evolved and moved on and, and kind of did its thing. And a lot of the Bulgarian lifters went back home and Ivan, opened up the center and went back to Bulgaria. Then, you know, he passed away and rest in peace and kind of things like that. But just the lifestyle, man, of, you know, kind of training in Europe, it feel like, you know, Eastern Europe for so long with so many different lifters. It was the culture is so different in other countries with weightlifting. It really is. And um, it was quite the experience. Wow. That right there is your equivalent to a Ph.D. in weightlifting. Yeah, no, I learned a lot and I'm thankful, you know, I got to train, uh, you know, one of my coaches with Alex Krychev, the silver medalist at the Olympics, uh, Martin Pashoff was one of my coaches, a uh, huge mentor of mine, Martin Pashoff, um, you know, Nikolai, um, you know, I was uh, trained, you know, with Ivan a few, di few different times, which was amazing. Um, obviously, Donnie, Max Ada, um, and then, you know, of course, Dave Spitz, a man that has you know, so much knowledge was, uh, was obviously my coach from, for, for many, many, many years. Um, and, and so to be around these lifters and these coaches, man, it's just like, you just try to take it all in, man. That's what you do is you just try to take it all in. You try to learn and you just, you, you got to just dive in. You got to trust what's happening. And a lot of lifters, I think, make the mistake of not diving in, not trusting the process and, you know, they're always looking for the grass to be greener. And anytime you're looking for the grass to be greener, man, your grass is just going to die. Yeah, that's so true. Man, that's incredible. And a lot of those names that you're mentioning are people that, in my mind, have shaped where weightlifting is at in America today, yourself included. So that's oh, incredible to live through that and experience that. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So training this way, what what were your best numbers that you got up to in the statue clean jerk? Oh man. So let's see here. At nine I was ninety four kilo weightlifter. That was the weight class back then. It's weird to say back then. It's crazy. Yeah. Right? Uh I was a ninety four, always, always training though at like ninety two. I was always light. Wow. I was not one of these ninety fours that trained at like ninety six, you know, or ninety five, like I was always under 94, and Coach Penley just was so mad at me all the time. He'd take me to pizza, all-you-can-eat pizza buffets, like daily, and just have me stuff my face. He would sit there, and he'd give me a list of pizza. He'd be like, all right, you have to eat 10 slices today. I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my goodness. So I'd sit there, and I'd have to eat 10 slices of pizza, like almost throwing up. So, you know, just stuffing my face. So I'd go back, and I'd lift. And I, was still, I was still always like a kilo or two under. I couldn't gain weight. We went to Hooters. You know, I've, I've written blogs about this. We go to Hooters and all you can eat wings, just stuffing my face. Just, oh, I hated it. And this was not by choice. Like I had, I had to eat like a certain amount of wings. Like I had to hit a certain amount of reps and sets and training. Like eating, eating back then was so important. I mean, weightlifters don't eat, you know, and that's, that's one thing that CrossFit has done so bad for weightlifting is the diets of CrossFit have carried over to weightlifting. It's hurt so many lifters with all this crap that's out. But <laughs> The thing is that, like, we ate so hard, like, hard, hard, um, you know, that we could train all day, and we won every meet we went to because we recovered. Yeah. And uh, lifters these days, I just don't think they're recovering hard enough. Uh, we, we always ate as hard as we trained, and we trained as hard as we ate. It was always vice versa. Um, and the food had to be just rough food. I mean, if I... If I ate too healthy, bro, I'd be an 85, and um, I just wouldn't be recovering properly. So, you know, Coach Penley had us over for dinner all the time. 
you know, we made homemade pastas and pizzas and like, you know, it was, you know, heavy carb, heavy protein diet pretty much. Yeah. Um, you know, Donnie was always cooking his Cajun food, man. Oh my gosh. We need so much Cajun food. You wouldn't even believe it. Got to eat. You know, he's, he's, you got to eat, man. He's from Louisiana. He's a Cajun man and, you know, raised as a Cajun and his, his, his Cajun food is just, you know, authentic, which was super cool. So to get to your point is I was weighing about 92 and I snatched 166 was uh, in training, which was at the time the unofficial American record. You can see it on YouTube there. And that was a huge lift. I was competing, always hitting usually like, you know, kind of high 50s, kind of low 60s, you know, um, in competition. Uh, at the time there, my best competition at California Strength uh, competition snatch was 163. Um, and I was pretty regularly hitting 160 in comp. So, and especially at that time, you couldn't touch that. Um, and so that was kind of my big one. As far as the clean and jerk goes, um, I was always better at the snatch. I still am. Um, so my clean and jerk was always kind of, you know, upper 80s, lower 90s. Clean and jerk in like 186, 192, 189, 185, you know, 191, kind of right around that area, uh, yeah. which was just good enough to wrap up a few medals um, and be competitive internationally and, and nationally. Uh, but everyone knew they could always kind of get me I'm in a competition. Amazing. Like I could always go into the clean and jerk with a big snatch lead. Mm -hmm. And for most lifters, it was always like, all right boy, this guy's got a 10 kilo lead on us in the snatch. Like there's no way and going against me is different. Okay. John's got a 10 kilo snatch lead. We got him, you know, cause a lot of my competitors were just, they were better in the clean and jerk than I was. And it always it made it a tight race. Right. Oh yeah. Wow. They're incredible numbers. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, so a big part of why I wanted to talk to you is, where you're at now and what happened kind of in between those cow strength, you know, competing internationally days and today. So you had some health troubles in the past couple of years, correct? Yeah. Yeah. I died for 16 minutes. <laughs> it just so casually yeah. I died for 16 How minutes. cold. Yeah. Yeah. At the Portland Zoo, looking at the elephants with my family, uh, my wife and my son, my daughter wasn't born yet. And, um, or, uh, she was, my wife wasn't even pregnant with Liv yet. So yeah, I mean, I just think about my daughter, like if I never came back, she wouldn't be here, you know? And that's what I think about. I don't really think about me. So I'm just blessed that, you know, God, uh, kept me here for some reason. And my, and my daughter's here because of it. And I think that's probably the reason why. So now I'm just here on just, you know, now I could just go at any time, you know, now that my daughter's here. So uh, but yeah, man, just looking at the elephants and I just dropped. That's the last thing I, I saw was, um, was that, and, uh, it kind of just changed, changed, changed everything. Wow. Yeah. I can imagine that's a life changing event. I mean, literally ending your life and being brought back. Yeah. What coming out of that, what's the mindset that changes just in your everyday life? Right. Well, you know, it's, it was, it's interesting because there's a time period where you're, you're so thankful to be alive and you're so thankful to be with your family and your close friends are there in the hospital with you. You know, I was in the ICU for, you know, about a month and, you know, you get out of the ICU, you go back home and you're just, you're still, you're just so grateful for the small things and family and you're reflecting and you're trying to still kind of figure out what happened and, uh, why am I here? You know, um, cause you know, I definitely went somewhere when I was dead. Um, and I had a full, a full conversation with a, with a, which I assume I think was a gold angel. Wow. Um, vividly I knew I was dead. So, um, so in the moment you could conscious oh, or sure. whatever no, it was, was, you was realized something was going on. Oh yeah. No, I was a hundred percent having a full, full conversation knowing I was dead I was definitely somewhere and if wow. you're not a religious person um, there's two things and I always say to my oh, my friends that are not religious is um, either I'm lying to you right now or I'm not yeah so let me tell you something right now I wouldn't want to take that gamble <laughs> all so right I, as my pastor says 
why roll the dice? So coming uh, from a man that's been there. So. Yeah. It's either I'm lying to you or or I'm telling you the truth. The I yeah, you know, it's uh that it's kind of really what it comes down to, to be honest. So um afterwards, um it, there's just that reflection of why am I here? What's my purpose? Thankful and, and you know, you just you're you're it's all extra credit, you know, your whole entire life, everything you do. Uh, at that point, especially, you know, even now, but really everything that you're doing at that time is just like, oh, my gosh, I'm having a meal right now. This is I shouldn't be eating. And I get to hug my son. And this is just extra credit. So then, you know, you start to really care more about the small things, man, and nothing. All the things that you thought were important are not. And it's kind of like this quarantine right now where so many things that were cut off from you're realizing are just really actually not necessities. Mm hmm. And there was then a time, Jordan, where after a good amount of time went by, then you kind of start thinking about life again and about how to support your family and business. And you're like, wait a minute, we're broke. You know, and um, yeah. my business is a entrepreneur and is a, a guy that was doing seminars and online team and clothing line and just all these um, this, the business that I that I had and still have. It's, you know, pivoted, you know, and changed here and there. But Attitude Nation was, there wasn't anything coming in. Closed, out of order, months. Yeah. And as people can see in this quarantine, when you're, when you're closed, there's nothing coming in. I wasn't yeah. getting, I wasn't working for a company that was like paying me like sick leave or something. So especially when the medical bills hit and I mean, it, it, with this heart defibrillator I have in me and the medical bill, I mean, you know, it was over half a million dollars. So insurance didn't cover crap. You know, I'm paying these medical bills. Nothing's coming in. And then it was like, I got to get back to work. Yeah. And that was it. It was training and lifting and grinding and coaching and, and seminars and just trying to, trying to, you know, do the best I can. Um, to kind of to kind of get the, the ball rolling again, um, but so much time went by that new cats in the game seminar business kind of just really slowed down. As you as you know now, seminars are not like they were at all. They're kind of dead, and uh, the market of the seminars, of the hype, the seminar, the seminar uh, ride you know, kind of uh, slowed down quite a bit. And uh, that was like the big one. So there was, there was a lot of stressful times too at that time of supporting my family. Um, and then when my daughter was born um, with a bad heart, you know, that, uh, that added a lot too. So I'm just, I'm grateful that my daughter's alive and she, she battled through her heart uh, disease that she still has, but she's doing great. And, um, you know, the fan, we've been through, I, I don't want to bore people, but we've been through a lot. Like when you, when you ask that question, you know, when I had the cardiac arrest, we've, the last, the last few years when I had that in, in the end of 2016, um, you know, the lot, you know, a few years after that, it was a real tough time for us. Yeah, I'd imagine. Well, we're grateful that you're here. You're still kicking. I'm sure your family's more grateful than we are. Uh, but that's an incredible story and the fact that you're able to come back from that and you're doing coaching and all this stuff now. You're still putting a lot of positivity out into the weightlifting world. That's incredible to see. Oh, thank you, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, it no was good problem. to be doing what I, what I love still, you know. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's why we're sitting here today because I recognize that and uh, mm -hmm. I really appreciate what you're doing. So – with all this collective experience and outlook that you've accumulated over all these years in weightlifting and just life experience through hardship and literally losing your life and coming back, how do you channel this into the things that you do now, like your coaching and, and your weightlifting team? I saw you with a big old gang of people at AO yeah. a couple months yeah. ago. Um, so, so can you talk a little bit how you form that team and how you use this experience to form them into weightlifters? Yeah. So, you know, Jordan, it's a good question, and it's 
going to be probably a different answer than people think, but I've always loved weightlifting. I've always been passionate for weightlifting, of course. Yeah. But, you know, from like muscle driver of 2013 to when I had my cardiac arrest, you know, kind of toward the, the last fourth quarter of my stretch before having the cardiac arrest in my weightlifting career, I, there was, there was two things that set me away from the sport as, as a whole. Money and internet fame really effed me up. Really effed me up. And I turned into a person that I just didn't really like. I didn't have God in my life. I um, became materialistic. Um, I was a pretty hardcore alcoholic. Um, kind of, you know... Marriage was on the rocks, um, traveled all the time, all the time. I was all over the world, all the time traveling. And, uh, you know, it, uh, at, the, at the peak of my career and at the peak of the height of my business at the time, because now it's, it's much better, but at that time, the peak of my business, I was the most unhappy. And, it, and it, I want people to understand that and I, I, back then it was, you know, I, I was making hand over fist as far as money. It was Jordan between, between us here on the show. It was quite ridiculous to be honest with you. And I was young, still pretty young. And I didn't know how to handle that. Jordan, I mean, like you heard the story. I was in a Dodge neon, you know, I was nice. a broke kid with a dream and, all of a sudden, now I'm traveling the world making hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. I mean, just insane. It was monopoly money, Jordan. I mean, it was crazy. Um, you know, crazy, crazy. I mean, yeah, just, just going from, from one, one end to the other. other. I don't know how to handle that. So it just got out of control, man. And I just, you know, then we had the thing with USAW where I just we weren't seeing eye to eye on a bunch of stuff and I left and then created the AWF and then AWF was a federation that I really loved and I still love and it kind of died when I died. Probably would it still be going on by now to be honest, but very successful um, federation. We were all over the place. and um, So AWF was your weightlifting federation, yeah, correct? You, yeah. you started that? Yeah, and I, I want to backtrack on the timeline a little bit. When I had my son, when my wife said she was pregnant, I, you know, stopped drinking and, um, you know, um, got, got my life back together. And uh, then around 2014 or 2015, we created the AWF and ran that for two years and was doing a lot better. Um, coaching and running the AWF and um, did a few bodybuilding shows and got into that world and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, but now, you know, now I'm back, AWF's gone. Now I'm just kind of back to where I started. And I think that is for, for people listening, Jordan, I think a lot of people can relate to that. And if you can't, maybe you should take this to heart because getting back to basics is so important. And getting back to that foundation and that platform that started everything is so important at times because you can get so out there and you get, you can get so lost in your own journey. Yeah, definitely. You know what I mean? Where you're just like, wait a minute, how did I end up here? You know, and, 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 you know, why am I doing bodybuilding? <laughs> and as much as I love the AWF, like, you know, why am I not competing in USAW? And, you know, at the time of 2013 and 14, why am I, you know, buying these things and never with my wife and why am I at this bar at 2 a.m.? Why, you know, like, what's, yeah. where am I? What's, what happened here? And then the journey could just take you different places that um, kind of have you scratching your head. So what I've done lately the last few years is I've just got back to basics, Jordan. I coach weightlifting. I do weightlifting. 
I love weightlifting, and um, I just I keep I keep it I keep it like that, man. I keep it simple. Um, you know, I, I don't want to go down those paths. I don't want to be the old me, um, and uh, learn from your mistakes and just grow as a human. Um, and I think that as of right now, it's just you know, simplicity is king, and that's that's kind of what I'm doing. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And it's almost like you said earlier, the grass always seems greener, and sometimes you have to see that the grass isn't greener <laughs> to come right. back to that green grass. Right, right. Um, so yeah, you know, and and I'll, I'll be blunt with you too, and I'm not scared to say it, but you know, I I found God and I I got saved, um, and uh, that was. You know, the interesting thing with that, that was in 2016 is when I got saved. That was actually two weeks before I died. Uh, wow. When I, when I accepted, you know, the Lord uh, into my life as my Savior and, uh, you know, that Jesus died for our sins and rose on the third day and, um, you know, accepted Christ 100% in my life. And I laid my sword down, um, you know, because, you know, you live your life fighting so much and you're, you're fighting the dragon and you're fighting with your sword and you think you can do it yourself and you you're prideful and you know you you think you're strong and it's all about you and I can do it and you know self-motivation and um, you know self-esteem and all these things that we think are going to help that don't um, and I finally just said man after so many failures and so many mistakes and so many um, just, uh, you know, defeats, like, I can't, you know, I can't do this myself. And I, I just laid the sword down and accepted God. And he's, he's been in my life ever since. And that doesn't make me perfect. That doesn't make me a good human. Um, you know, but it, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's helped out a ton. Um, and I got baptized after, you know, I got out of the hospital. And, um, so yeah, that's a, that's a big change in my life is, is my relationship with God. Wow. So is that kind of what guides you now in your everyday practices? A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. It's all about him. It's not about me. You know, we're here for him. We're not, he's not here for us. And we, 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 as, as humans, we get that twisted, you know, God, why not? Why are you not doing this for me? And me, 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 me. And you know, it's not about us, you know, yeah. um, it's, it's, it's not. And, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, I've been humbled over the years. Let's put it that way. Yeah, absolutely. It's not about us. And I'm sure anyone can take something from that statement, whether they're, you know, whatever their religion is. Mm -hmm. But it's it's bigger than all of us. Mm -hmm. So so that's right. cool to hear. Mm -hmm. um, all right. I don't want to take too much of your time, but um, the people that want to find you, uh, can you tell them where you're at about your coaching, how to get in touch with you? Yeah, I mean, you can follow me on Instagram at Attitude Nation. Um, and, um, you know, I do a lot of posting there, training, all that kind of stuff. Go to our website, doweightlifting.com. Uh, we do some, some programming and some, uh, I do some online coaching. We've got a great team, great community uh, there. And um, also do a podcast called Red Circle Radio. Uh, we go live, uh, Spreaker.com, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R, -E -E kind of a funky name, Spreaker with an R. Uh, but if you go to DoWayLifting.com, we actually have all the podcasts from 2012 to now uh, recorded on there. So um, all the way back, all the different guests and interviews we've done, it's all there on DoWayLifting.com. So that, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Awesome. Well, thank you, John. I appreciate you for hanging out with us this morning. You have an incredible story. So thanks for telling us. Hey, thanks for having me, Jordan. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, no problem.